Hello, this is Free Thought Forum, a program by the Atheist Society of Knoxville and the Rationalists of East Tennessee. I'm Faithless Forrest. I'm Jen Taylor. And I'm Joe Barnhart. And we want you to know that if you don't believe in God, you're not alone. Right here in East Tennessee, you can find free-thinking atheists and agnostics. This is a show for them and for people committed to a life rooted in science and unfettered by supernatural beliefs or people who are interested in the same. Today's show, we will be having a phone interview with Jennifer Hancock about humanism. So before the program begins, let's talk a little about our sponsors very right. briefly. The Atheist Society of Knoxville frequently has a fun meetup at a bar or eatery. The next meetup is Tuesday, about 5, 5.30 p.m. at a, for us, relatively new location, the Black Horse Pub and Brewery. That's on 4429 Kingston Pike, Knoxville in the Western Plaza Shopping Center. For details, go to knoxvilleatheist.org. That's atheist with a plural S. Um, and uh, when you get to the meetup, look for the silver jacketed copy of The God Delusion uh, standing upright on the table. And as Matt Delahunty at Atheist Experience says, everyone is welcome to our meetup for food, drink, and conversation. But if you plan to preach, proselytize, provoke, or punch, please don't. <laughs> uh, no, don't. <laughs> the Rationalists of East Tennessee have several regular meet monthly meetings. See our website, rationalists.org, for details. The first and third Sunday mornings of the month are usually lectures with lively roundtable discussions. The second Sunday, we hold the Skeptics Book Club. On the fourth Sunday, we are mixing it up. Sometimes we get a get we we with a potluck or get together in in a member's home. We call that reflections. Okay, and the um, later in the show, uh, you can consult the website to visit for details. That'll give you locations and times. All righty. Well, we're going to move to in the news and. Um, uh, the, the item in the news today is uh, the death of Stephen Hawking. Um, he, uh, yeah, although we heard about it uh, late on March 13, our time, he actually died on March 14 uh, in his time zone. Um, and I was explaining to um, you know, uh, friends and uh, people here on the panel that this is for our generation kind of like what the death of Albert Einstein was, yeah. you know, a little over well, about 60 years ago. Um, and I've, I've grabbed a little excerpt about his life, a little biographical piece off of the Wikipedia uh, page about him. Describes him as Stephen William Hawking, CB, CBE, FRS, FRSA. He was born on 8 January uh, 1942 during World War II. Mm -hmm. and he died uh, Today, March 14, uh, 2018, he's an English theoretical physicist, cosmologist, and author and director of research at the Center for Theoretical Cosmology within the University of Cambridge. His scientific works include collaborations with Roger Penrose on gravity, gravitational singularities mm -hmm. and theorems in the framework of general relativity and theoretical predictions that black holes emit radiation, yeah. often called Hawking radiation. Mm -hmm. Hawking was the first to set out a theory of cosmology explained by a union of the general theory of relativity and quantum mechanics. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a vigorous supporter of the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. Now, I'm a physicist by education, and I actually understood all of that. And I've, I've read his his book, Brief History of Time, um, and it was a dazzling thing to read. It came out, I think, in the early '90s, and the chapter in there that explained how black holes would um, have this thing that's now called Hawking radiation was it was so surprising. And I I, I was you know kind of like just who would have thought? Who would have thought? And it was so cool. 
Um, but you guys at least recognize his name, right? Yes. Uh, uh, neither of you have read his book? Uh, no, we haven't, but I have seen him on The Simpsons. Um, and yes, and he, 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 <laughs> and he, is, theory. <laughs> he, he is singular as a, as a scientist sure. in our time yes. that he has crossed over into popular culture. Mm -hmm. right. and, and Einstein did that too during his lifetime. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, you know, uh, he's a, you know, it's a remarkable life um, uh, that he lived. Uh, and even more remarkable in the fact that, you know, when he was in his early 20s, you know, he was diagnosed with a disease that usually kills people within like two, two years. years. Yeah. Um, and the world's a, a, a different and a better place for him having uh, yes. been here with us. Perhaps we'll talk more about him on future shows. So, um, but uh, so let's move on to, to, the on to the program. Yeah, yeah. Okay. you got the first line here, Joe. Okay. <laughs> Hello, Jennifer Hancock. Hello. <laughs> I'm Joe Barnhart, as, and you're there. Uh, Yay. <laughs> hi, Jennifer. Hi, Joe. It's, it's Jen Taylor. <laughs> okay, and then hi. hi Jen. Good to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm still Faithless Forest, and we meet again. You, I met you when you were in our studio. Um, um, this is the first time uh, Jen Taylor has hosted. And so it might make sense for all four of us to do at least a little brief bio of one another. And I'll set the tone for that by going first. I'm so greedy. I'm a physicist <laughs> who's a lifelong non-believer, uh, grew up in Minnesota and came to Tennessee, where it was a little bit unnerving to uh, when you met strangers for them to say, hello, and where do you go to church? <laughs> Jen Taylor? Hi, I'm Jen, and I'm originally from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I grew up in a home with um, parents who were of two different religions, uh, dad, Southern Baptist, and mom, Jehovah's Witness. So that was a really uh, uh, a interesting time growing up. <laughs> and it's only been in the last five years that I've been active within the um, secular community. Uh -huh. <laughs> And I'm Joe Barnhart. I grew up here in Knoxville and I lived in, went to Boston University and Harvard and then I taught in California <laughs> and adopted my daughter from Iowa. Oh. <laughs> and uh, spent 40 years at the University of North Texas. And so back to my hometown where you have nice forests and, <laughs> and corn. And good, good, <laughs> yeah, and multiple kind of corn of different kinds. Yes. And pretty coming from me. <laughs> So I'm glad to be back into the hills. Mm -hmm. And Jen Hancock? Hello. Um, uh, so I actually have relatives up that way. <laughs> oh, good. And I was raised, uh, yeah, we, ha we have relatives up in uh, Maryville and South Knoxville, so we go up there all, a lot, which is why I've met uh, uh, Faithless Forest before. Um, and I grew up in a non-religious household. My mom's extended family is Jewish. My dad's extended family is Catholic. They were neither. And I'm actually have, my dad told me I was third generation free thinker on his side. And my mom said basically the same thing on her side. So, uh, you know, I, I come by my humanism naturally. Oh, that's <laughs> I, wonderful. <laughs> I don't have any trauma. So there you go. All righty. I, I came here to escape the winters of Minnesota. What, what took you to Florida? Oh, uh, so I grew up in Los Angeles. Oh. And mm. at some point I watched the movie Day of the Dolphins and read the book, and I decided I wanted to go study dolphins. So I went to school in Hawaii and got a degree in linguistics. Uh, well, cognitive linguistics is a long story. It's not really linguistics. It's more liberal studies with psychology and anyways. And then I moved back to L.A., and at some point I woke up and realized I had accomplished what I wanted to learn by being in Los Angeles again, and it was time to find a permanent home. So being the analytical math geek I am, I did a geographic survey and narrowed down my choices to a few places, and then I went and visited them. And when I crossed the Green Bridge into my hometown, I thought, this is home. And six months later, I packed up all my belongings and moved without a job. And it was a good thing I moved here because I met my husband. Wow. <laughs> He's from South Knoxville, so go figure. <laughs> Wonderful. All righty. Well, um, the motivation behind um, uh, some of our shows, uh, actually a lot of our shows this uh -huh. year, has been to focus on humanism. Mm -hmm. uh, and we started that in January. 
And, and it's because there was this uh, court case that I had read about. Yeah. Uh, and I guess I've written it was a Nevada decision. I may have misspoken earlier and said that it was a Texas decision. It was a Nevada decision at the appellate level um, that ruled that humanism is not a religion when it comes to protecting a prisoner's rights. Yeah. How did the judge defend this idea of his? So, I've got some excerpts here. He dismissed the federal claims with leave to amend because plaintiff had not alleged how his humanist beliefs differed from traditional secular moral philosophy in such a way as to qualify as a religion under the religious clauses. And then he, further on, there was a, you know, a sentence that said, it is not a religion for the purposes of the religion clause. Religion is the belief in and reverence for a supernatural power accepted as the creator and governor of the universe. And he was quoting uh, Webster's um, number two New Riverside University Dictionary from 1988. Um, and you know, I, I kind of felt that the judge really put his foot in that. Um, uh, he, and he wrote, uh, I guess his decision was on December 4th of 2017. Mm -hmm. He was Judge Robert C. Jones. The case was, I'm going to mangle this, Espinoza versus Stogner. Stogner. Or Stogner. He, he wrote of secular humanism that uh, it is not a religion for the purposes of the religious clauses, neither the Supreme Court nor this circuit has ever held that evolutionism or secular humanism are religions for establishment clause purposes. Indeed, both the dictionary definition of religion and the clear weight of the case law are to the contrary. And yeah, you know, it's funny that he would he would you know, it sounds like he drug evolution into this subject. I don't I can't imagine that the that the prisoner <laughs> plaintiff said, oh yeah, and we're gonna, you know, you know, uh, bow in reverence to evolution or something like that. This this guy has a serious problem with, you know, wanting to pick and choose amongst religions. Uh -huh. So, let me interrupt you. At the Southern Baptist Center. We Sunday. had something like that happen in Florida when I was working with the Humanists of Florida. We had a clerk try to deny our tax exemption um, at the state level because she didn't think humanism qualified for the religious exemption, even though the American Humanist Association at the time had a 501c3 religious uh -huh. exemption. So. Mm -hmm. Um, and it, it, you know, we, we brought kind of the law down on her and explained, look, you don't get to decide what is a religion and what isn't a religion. It's not, it's beyond your pay grade, right? Now, it is the pay grade of a judge to determine that, but there's a lot of international law and state law and federal law, and I think even the U.S. military treats humanism as, you know, a, a religion in terms of protection for the individual who wants to have time off to meet with other humanists. And internationally, humanism is considered an ethical life stamp on par with religion and is, is granted the same rights at the international level as religious organizations. So, um, yeah, that judge is off base. Yeah, you can. I, I've taught several religion courses. Oh. And one thing uh, I try to start off with is a definition of religion and discover quickly that you could get a lot of different definitions, just definitions of religion. Uh, right. And so to have a judge just suddenly decided that he knows what it is after not obviously not studying it very much, <laughs> uh, I thought it was brother. Well, isn't that partly, though, the, the plaintiff should have brought in the case law that says differently than what the judge decided? Exactly. <laughs> well, well, I, I suspect that that'll happen when an appeal occurs. Well, we, we've got... Apparently the judge didn't consult the Marion... Oh, we've... we've hey... We've got a, f a phone call. Why don't we take okay, this let's call? Okay, take it. Good phone call. Go ahead. Hello, caller. Can you give us a name or a nickname? My name is Joe. Hello, Joe. And uh, give, do you have a short comment or a question for us? I think I recognize your voice. I got a question. Yeah. Okay. Great. You, you're. You're. And Joe, you you host one of the shows also on our on this cable channel as well, don't you? Right. All right. Go What's ahead. your question, Joe? You, you want to know what the question is? Sure. Uh-huh. Am I on the air right now? Yes, you're live. Oh, I want to know why are you, why are you an atheist? I mean, what, what's the reason? 
Why don't we each answer that real quickly? Joe, I'm um, a physicist by education, which means I study the natural world, and I think that that explains uh, everything about it and that the explanations religions offer are not, are not merely unnecessary. They're actually wrong. Jen? Well, um, I, I'll start with a short story. Well, when I was about six years old, I had well, a lot There's a lady answering right now. Raise your hand so he knows. Hi, how you doing? <laughs> um, basically, what, what happened was when I was about six years old, I had a Bible study with um, one of the sisters from the Kingdom Hall, Jehovah's well, excuse Witnesses. Excuse me, am I actually on the air? Yes. Yes, yes. Joe. You're live. Oh, okay, and go ahead. she was going over the flood story from the Bible. And in the Bible, uh, what she was dis discussing was that um, we we had a book called My Book of Bible Stories, and we had a uh, we had graphic pictures of people crying and animals drowning and things like that. And I looked at the I looked at it, and I and I asked the sister. I said, Hey, um, um, you know what's what. What, what, what happened to the dinosaurs? Why, why are they drowning? And she said that God was done with the dinosaurs. The dinosaurs were put here to flatten the earth just enough <laughs> for um, people to be able to walk upon it. And I was really taken aback by that. And I, and I just started thinking, well, what's going to happen when God's done with us? So I, I started really reading the Bible and studying it, and I've read the Bible cover, cover to cover about three times, and I, I just could not find that belief within me. And I believed, when I did believe, I thought that this was an entity that um, relished the idea of us suffering, and it wasn't about love. Uh -huh. And I decided to lead a life that was full of love. And part of that led me to being a secular humanist and doing for others and community service. And it was a but kind of a, it was a, is, are you, it are was you an evolution. Are you this on what that one lady says or are you, uh, uh, have you reached this conclusion by reading the Bible? Yes, basically I read the Bible. Yeah. All right. Um, all right, Joe. Barnhart. Okay, well, I was lucky to be teaching in the university, and I had a um, courses I taught in religion, one of which was the New Testament I taught for years, and studied it in theology school and before that. And um, I came to see, uh, after many, many years, that all believers are also unbelievers. For example, if you're a Baptist, you're not a Jehovah's Witness. If you're a Jehovah's Witness, you're not a Mormon. So all believers are unbelievers. And so uh, and to say you're an unbeliever is pretty obvious. You cannot believe in everything. And even among Protestants, you have diversity of views. You've got the Church of Christ, for example. And, uh, when well, I, I know you've got 34,000 different denominations uh, in America. Right, uh, I appreciate it, but you're not answering none of my questions. Um, I, actually, I think we have. We, I'm, let, let's, and let's I'm get... answering it for the audience. Uh, what I'm trying to show is the diversity of viewpoints. And what I'm saying is somebody's view of God is not another person's view of God. So from one but point... I understand this, but my so what's your problem? Is, let, let me ask you one specific it, question. Yeah, my question. Let's hear it specifically. You're, you're an atheist because people believe different things. Is that what, uh, you're not clear. Okay, I'm a naturalist. See, an atheist has got the word, or the letter A in front of it. That just means non-theists. So you're asking specifically, what do I believe, not what I don't believe. No, no, I'm not asking you what you, I'm asking you why are you an atheist? Okay, you know, I, I'm, I'm, clear, I'm answering. I'm answering the question. I'm answering the question. Now, I'll, I'll give you more details if you'll pay attention, okay? I'm now, paying close attention. Good. Now, an atheist is just a word saying you don't believe in theism. Are you with me? You no, know, uh, listen, 
Uh, thanks for keeping taking my call. This conversation is going anywhere. Go ahead. You just you... throw around 50 cent words, and most people don't even know what you're talking about. But <laughs> well, I think most people do. J- Joe, don't give up on us. We'd, we'd like up. you to call uh, back again. But actually, you haven't heard the answer from our guest today, which is uh, actually on a phone. And that's Jennifer Hancock. Jennifer, I, I'm afraid we've saved you to last. The reason, yeah, the reason I'm an atheist is because I don't believe in anything supernatural. Sure. And I was raised with you don't want to shoot it. You don't believe in raised, what? Uh, you know, I explored a bunch of different religions, and until I decided I was an atheist, I was actually an agnostic. I didn't have an opinion either way. Hold on, my cat is demanding exit from the room. All right, Joe. And, um, mm-hmm. well. and uh, at some point, I realized I didn't believe that we had evolved a transcendent soul, and without the existence of tr- transcendent soul, the question of God was completely irrelevant. So I stopped worrying about it. So I'm actually. Uh, this, this, I understand. I understand exactly what you're saying. My question is this. They don't know what you mean when you say God, but they, ultimately listen, they don't believe like in Like I said, you're, you're, you're talking too much. Exists. you got to be point um, blank when you talk so to me. I don't really spend my time And my about question things. is this. You are an atheist because you don't believe in a supernatural. Is that what you're saying? That's what she said, yes. Go ahead. Okay, well, you answered my question. You know, uh, Mm -hmm. Uh, It's kind of hard for me to believe that all this stuff just happened. Uh Just because there's 34,000 different denominations, and uh, you use that for the reasoning of there's too many people believing too many different things, that doesn't even make any sense. Do you think God just happened? Of course not. Who created him? Who knows? Man. <laughs> okay, so that, that, that makes you an agnostic. That makes you an agnostic. That's all I know. Well, let's not well, laugh. If you're going to ask me questions that nobody has the answer to, it, we're going to go nowhere. Well, you're an agnostic. Okay, fine. Go ahead. All right. What do you mean I'm agnostic? You just said you didn't know. That's what agnosticism means. It, it means Look absence. Look it up in the dictionary. It means absence of knowledge. And, and what you're saying here is what you believe you know, right? That's what most of us say when we know something. Yeah, I have a brief answer to that. Oh. So, caller Joe, uh, yeah. as a physicist, I know enough about the history of how our planet formed mm-hmm. and the universe around us to know that the story no, you of, you do not. Of, of the Book of Yahweh <laughs> is obvious man-made myth, just like the Greek gods. How long have we been here? How long have we been on this earth? Joe, Joe, do you know that the Greek gods are man-made myth? I'm challenging your, your answer here. You said you know enough about history. Yeah, no, I'm saying you don't. Um, you don't I, know I, what he does. I, Joe, I have in my pocket a fossil of stromatolites that's two billion years old, and that's so incompatible. You said you don't know that. And that's incompatible with um, the idea that Yahweh made the world in six days. Um, as well as we can look out with our telescopes and see planets and stars, well, actually we see technically uh-huh. stars uh-huh. forming. Right now, we see how the process works. And when we look at the planet we so, live on, uh, listen, listen, we I realize that it works theory. the same I, way. I understand what you believe yeah. in a theory, okay? So, but anyway, uh, like I said, I don't want right. to waste all this time. So anyway, thanks for taking my call. Sure, right. thank you. Well, we heard Joe's theory. Thank, Please, yes. yeah, hang, yeah, all right. Thank you, Joe. Perhaps when he reads the Bible cover to cover, he'll give us a call back. <laughs> so for the benefit of my hosts and uh-huh. for Jennifer Hancock, Joe, Joe does another show um, here on, uh, in this studio. Uh-huh. I think it's called, oh, I'm going to, I'm sorry, Joe, I've forgotten the name of your program. Maybe it's What's Happening? No, no it's not What's Happening. He, he didn't. Yeah. He's not um, with us. Well, he, he's, he's, he's listening or watching. Um, and thank you for the calling. I can never figure out with people of faith that are really concerned about people who don't believe is why they even care whether I believe or not. Okay, here, try this. That, that, well, that, that's an interesting question. Well, here's the point that I was trying to make. Because like, I'm not bothered by their belief. They can believe anything they want. It doesn't really hurt me unless they believe I should be hurt, right? right. And most people don't believe something like that. They believe in whatever they believe in, but they, you know, it's usually not a malevolent God that's asking them to kill a bunch yeah. of people, right? Most, most God belief is actually pretty benign. So I, I sit there and I think, well, if I'm not bothered by their belief, why are they bothered by my non-belief? <laughs> like, what is the problem with me okay. believing w- would you Okay, would you agree uh, that all believers are also unbelievers? 
Um, oh, we, we've been signaled that we have another caller, and callers are fun, so why don't we take this Let's caller? Let's take another caller, yeah. All right. Hello, caller. Can you give us a name or a nickname, please? Good and loud. We can hear you. Please speak up. It's kind of muffled. It's Charles from Central Illinois. Hello, Charles. Good. Hey. Go ahead. Well, uh, I'd like to respond to the uh, her thing, why they are bothered by what I believe. Uh, okay, great. Um, uh, many of the uh, sects of the Abrahamic faiths are um, dominant type mindsets. And anybody that doesn't, you know, match their particular way of doing things threatens their exclusive mm -hmm. rights to of knowledge and power. Yeah, can you speak up louder? I can't hear you. One moment. I can't hear him either. Hold on one moment. You're doing good there. Just keep speaking at that volume, Charles. So he said that Abrahamic oh. believers feel threatened by non-believers. Yes, and by different believers as well. Certain, okay. certain elements within. That's a good point. Wait, what so, was that again? He feels threatened or not threatened? By, by unbelievers and other believers, yeah. different believers. He feels threatened or not? A, a, he said that, they so Char Charles, Charles is a regular caller. He's a non-believer. He said that the previous caller apparently feels threatened by our non-belief. Not necessarily. Well, well, some of them certainly do. They accuse us non-believers of all sorts of atrocities that they cannot demonstrate to have actually have happened. Mm -hmm. Look at the history between, say, Catholicism, Protestantism, and Judaism, mm -hmm. and how they accused each other of savage, vicious cruelties, up to including sacrificing babies to make their uh, well, communion wafers and uh, things of that nature. Because it's not the, the general laity I'm talking about. Well, to be I'm fair, talking about the, the clerical, clerical types. Yeah. Now, to be fair to Judaism and Christianity, they don't believe in sacrificing babies. In fact, they've got commandments against it. So let's yeah, well, the whole point is, is that uh, the other people think that they're lying and that they're Mm -hmm. embedded by the power of evil and they're going to try to destroy everything yeah. well, let me propose they don't a, believe as they do. Let me propose a theory and see what you think. That um, what one person might call theism, another person might call atheism. For example, I have a view of God. If there is going to be a God, he has to be good by definition. And if he's evil, then he's not God. So what some people's version of God, come, what they come up with, it, this being is so evil that I would not call them believers in theism or God. They're atheists. Okay. They're various kinds of atheists. They're denominations among atheists. I'm my own God. Yeah. <laughs> when I look at a mirror, I God. <laughs> well, for example, as we pointed out on another program, Joseph Stalin is an atheist. But that's not my kind of atheism. <laughs> In fact, some of my some of my atheists, I mean, some of my atheist friends have ethics very similar to their Christian friends. And and some of my best friends are Christians, but they don't like certain kinds of Christian views, which they regard as more atheistic, like Stalin. For example. Sending most people to hell, according to the evangelical view, is so evil from the viewpoint of some theists that these, this view of evangelicalism is mostly a form of vicious atheism. They don't have a God. It's not good enough to call God. And in that, fact, that then leads us to what humanism is all about. That's the point of today's show point, and point. Our, our, our interviewee. You know, jump in on that and say, well, I mean, the kind of point is that religion, you know, ethics is separate from religion 
and it tends to overlay with religion, but it doesn't necessarily follow from any particular belief about God, not God, or whatever. Um, you have humanistic Christians, and you have Good fundamentalist Christians, and you have um, Good zealot Christians, right? That's you, a and good the same point. thing within Islam, and the same thing within Buddhism, and the same thing within whatever. Mm -hmm. There's a yes. huge range of beliefs, and so to me, it's pretty clear that well, some people ascribe their, you know, their ethics to their beliefs. The reality is they hold the ethics, and then they overlay onto whatever the belief is that mm -hmm. they have. Because you have. You know, you have humanistic atheism and non-humanistic atheism, right? So, exactly. um, mm -hmm. it's the ethics are separate from the religion, even though they get conflated. But yes, that was point. the point I was trying to make. They conflate things. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good point. They conflate the concept that since you don't believe what I believe, you must be serving the evil one. Okay. Uh huh. With the concept that uh, that uh, the other person's idea of the evil one is completely and utterly different than what the uh, first person does, but they cannot accept that fact. To them, it's their way and their way only. Stalin was a narcissistic sociopath, uh -huh. okay, and he couldn't care less about what other people believe. It was either toe his line or else. Mm -hmm. And there are many people both in all religions and in, yes, even in the atheist community was exactly the same way. That's a good point, very good point. All right. Thank you. Which I think is we've, why we need humanism. I think we've uh, covered some things well point. here. Charles, we should probably thank you, ask you to clear the line, and then what we need to do is jump into our script here and talk about humanism. Yeah, while well, we're thank at you, it. Thank you, Charles. Charles, have a good one. <laughs> Bye. All right. And so um, we, we've got a slide here about what is humanism, and if we jump to page five, Joe, I think we have you reading um, the definition. Can we okay. get our slide up, Rev, yeah, on sure what do. is humanism? Here's, what it, here's a definition of humanism. It's an outlook or system of thought or belief attaching prime importance to human rather than divine or supernatural matters. Humanist beliefs stress the potential value and goodness of human beings, emphasizing our common human needs and rational abilities for solving our problems. A Renaissance cultural movement turned away from medieval scholasticism and helped us to go back to study some of the Greeks, the Greek philosophers who were philosophers but also humanists. Now you can be a philosopher and not a humanist, but uh, Socrates, in particular, was a humanist who went around and from market to market trying to discover how people could interact with each other. So, humanism is emphasizing our common needs and many common goals we have together as human beings. And this helps us to see that we have some things in common with other creatures like dogs and that's why we don't beat dogs. Is they, we say, well, dogs have feelings too. And so we try to be humane toward dogs. <laughs> All righty. So, um, Jennifer, you've written a book with the title in it. Uh -huh. uh, Taylor, can we ask you to hold Jennifer's book up? Yeah. There we go. And Jennifer, good you're, you're our guest here. Take it away. Tell us more about humanism. All right. So, I like the American Humanist Association definition that came out in the most recent manifesto, Humanism and Its Aspirations, uh -huh. which is that humanism is a progressive philosophy of life that, without supernaturalism, affirms our ability and responsibility to lead ethical lives of personal fulfillment that aspire to the greater good of humanity. So, in plain English, the motto I wrote for myself when I was 11 is live life fully, love other people, and leave the world a better place. That is my mm -hmm. goal as a humanist. That's very right? And that's, that's still good. That's, humanism that's great. As the academic humanism, which is the study of the humanities, right? It's the study of humans. Mm -hmm. But the philosophic movement that started, um, what, in the 19, early 19, late 1800s, early 1900s, um, is specifically without supernaturalism. Mm -hmm. um, because, and it's a pride for me, 
the, the without supernaturalism part is important as a pragmatic matter, not as a theological matter. I'm not really concerned about the theology. I'm concerned about it as a pragmatic problem-solving thing. Um, if believing in God doesn't help me solve my problems, then there's no point in believing in God. And that's the problem with supernaturalism. I, I can't really pray to make it rain. I mean, I mm -hmm. could pray to make it rain, but it's not going to be an effective way to get water on my fields. Um, irrigating my field, digging a ditch, doing something constructive as a human is going to mm -hmm. ensure I get water on my field where praying for rain may or may not work. So from a pragmatic matter, I'm going to take the non-supernatural approach because it helps me solve my problems more reliably. Mm -hmm. And so to me, that's what the without supernaturalism part about it is, but it's all geared towards how do I live life fully, how do I make the world a better place, and how do I be a good person? And to me, being a good person is all about loving my neighbor and, and mm -hmm. loving everybody, really, which is why sure. the term humanism, I think, for me, is such a powerful word, uh -huh. is because it's a reminder, just using the word reminds me that everyone who's human is human. Would you and agree? therefore, they're part of my family. Let me ask you this. If the and word, I treat them as such. The word human, as you're defining now, you try to incorporate other human beings with common values. Now, right. Let me see what you think of this. I had at the Boston University a professor who was a theist, and his view was called personalism, but his ethics was humanism. Right. In other words, he was a personalistic, theistic humanist. And when I listened to him, I took a course on ethics, and I said to him, I see no difference between your view of ethics than some of the humanists who are not believers in a God. In other words, their, their common ethics was obvious to me. Right, and it's a common, there's been studies on global ethics that show that pretty much everybody in the world, regardless of where they're raised and regardless of what faith they're in, kind of settle on the same set of human ethics, and we might disagree on where they come from. I know my friends with Faith will say, well, your compassion, which is the center of most everybody's uh -huh, system, good, yeah, comes from God, right? But I, I believe that we evolved to have compassion. It's part of our evolutionary toolkit. But to me, it doesn't really matter how you get to the point of compassion, only that you get there, right? <laughs> I'm less concerned with the, the journey to compassion as I am with the destination of what mm -hmm. compassion does for us as individuals and throughout society as an ethical compass. Oh, that's a good so point. That's I'm a... fine with people coming to compassion uh -huh. through faith as long as they get there. That's a good pragmatic approach. In other words, if you're yeah, common... Yeah, well, I'm a pragmatist. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> but to me, that's, that's why I think humanism adopts common human ethic uh -huh. as right. opposed to originating the common That's human good, ethic. Yeah. We're just adopting what's already there. And that and, way and if you and, and I think the one thing that we do differently mm -hmm. is we are unapologetic about the compassion. Yes. This is the center of our moral universe, <laughs> period. And yes. we are not very um, understanding of people who do not put compassion first. Would you agree would you agree that, let me ask you a that question bad results. Right. Would so you we don't agree? For the would you agree that compassion includes empathy? Oh yeah. Now empathy, if I understand it, includes not just feeling what other people feel, if you can, but also understanding their viewpoint. In other words, yeah. a good a good humanist ought to be able to converse well with a theist to find out what they have in common and what they can learn from each other. In other words, Which it's quite conceivable. Faith well, I'm trying to say it's... Fans of my work. Go ahead, say I that again. I had a preacher's wife read my book and say it's a great add-on to the Bible uh -huh. because the morality is for morality. Yeah. I'm just giving here and now reasons why the morality works. Mm -hmm. She has her supernatural views about why this morality works, but you know, the problem with supernatural morality is if you have to wait until after you're dead to get the consequence, anybody who does behavioralism knows that's too far away. Uh -huh. And, it's, you know, you need, you need to understand the here and now consequences of your actions to really understand how to make good decisions that's going to benefit yourself and others. And so that's what she said my book was like. It, it, 
I've had a lot of people of faith read the humanist approach to happiness and say it's a it, you know it took a humanist and an atheist to teach them how to be a good Christian. <laughs> oh, that's a that's, that's a great uh, that's great good. point. Jennifer, we're, we're looking at the clock here, and we're about 20 minutes left in our show, and we'd like to do our mid-program break, so we'd like to ask you to hang on while we paw through a few pages here and talk about our sponsors. So viewers, in case you're just tuning in, this is Free Thought Forum, a program by the Atheist Society of Knoxville and the Rationalists of East Tennessee. Free Thought Forum is funded jointly by them and by individual contributions. We want to thank DW for substantially funding this show. We've moved. <laughs> this is our new regular time. Every Wednesday from 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. Eastern on Knoxville Community Access Television, channel 6, 12, 99, or 193, dependent on your local cable network. Tell your out-of-town friends to see us streaming online at ctvnox.org. Uh -huh. That's, that's ctvnox.org. And uh, we are alive on this program. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a lively program. <laughs> Hope you can notice <laughs> March 14. <laughs> yes, happy Pi Day. <laughs> and you, and uh, you, uh, you can see our number on the screen. And maybe you could call in some more and talk with us. And now we got to move toward a short break, don't we? Yeah. If you live in or around the Knoxville area and are questioning your religious beliefs or simply believe in one less God than everyone else, well, you're not alone. The Atheist Society of Knoxville is a fun and friendly group of people just like you that meets twice a week at a bar or restaurant. We meet every Tuesday night following the show. You'll find our group either inside or on the patio. Look for Richard Dawkins' silver-jacketed book, The God Delusion, standing upright on the table. But if you plan to preach, proselytize, provoke, or punch, please don't. We all question what we believe at one point in our lives. If this is the time for you, come join us for food, drink, conversation, and fun. Do you find stories of talking snakes laughable? Do you prefer the scientific method over supernatural beliefs? Are you concerned about religious leaders and organizations imposing their values and rules on your body, your family, and the rest of our society? Well, take comfort in the fact that you're not alone. The Rationalists of East Tennessee meets for fellowship and provides a forum for people who support skeptical thinking and rational discussion of these and other issues. To find out more information or to find out about our next meeting, visit us on the web at www.rationalist.org. All right, and it looks like the video started over. All right, and we are back. I think you have the script here. Hey. The Atheist Society of Knoxville, or ASK, meets one or more times a week. Mm -hmm. We have evening meetups for fun, food, drink, and conversation. Find us online, knoxvilleatheist.org. The purpose of ASK is to supply a venue for community, camaraderie, and outreach to atheists, agnostics, free thinkers, and other like-minded persons in the East Tennessee area. Next Tuesday, next Tuesday's meeting is at 5.30 p.m. As of March 6, we have moved to Black Horse Pub and Brewery located at 4429 Kingston Pike, Knoxville, in the Western Plaza Shopping Center. Okay, the third Sunday, the topic is Mr. David Bolt's uh, presentation, An Engaged Community and Building a Sustainable Future. And he's talking about a sustainable lifestyle. And uh, Tennessee uh, Permacultural Research Institute and so forth. Yeah. And in other words, they're doing a lot of work in this area. And the meeting is at 10.15 a.m. the Cafeteria Annex at the Goins Administrative Building at Hardin Valley Campus. And that's a Pellissippi State Community College. And although the script didn't say it, that's an a Rationalist of East Tennessee activity. The Rationalists also have the Skeptics Book Club. It meets the second Sunday of most months. And the book for April on the 11th is Unapologetic, 
Why Philosophy of Religion Must End by John Loftus. The time <laughs> is uh, 2 to 4 p.m. The location is Books A Million, 8513 Kingston Pike, Knoxville. That's just a little bit east of the, um, I think there's a Shoney's uh, restaurant there. Uh -huh. You need not have read the book to attend, but of course, it helps. <laughs> See www.rationalists.org for program or meeting time and locations and a list of future books. All right, so um, we have with us today on the phone Jennifer Hancock, uh, author of A Humanist Approach to Happiness. Maybe this would be a good time. Jennifer, you've written some other books. What are those titles? Uh, I've written a book called The Bully Vaccine, which applies uh, oh, compassionate nice. philosophy with applied behavioral science to uh -huh. teach how to actually make unwanted behaviors like bullying stop. So how to train a bully to leave you alone using science and compassion. And it does work. We have seven decades of research on how to extinguish unwanted behavior, and it turns out that taking a compassionate approach works. Um, and then I also have books on uh, the humanist approach to grief. I have a humanistic management books on reality-based decision-making, uh, how to, um, why conflict management doesn't work when the problem is bullying, um, reality-based decision-making for effective strategy development. Uh, sl slow Especially down. Just to how to win arguments without arguing, things like that. You, you were related to my humanist learning website. You were way too fast. I'm going to make you say those last couple of books or, or whatever again, because I didn't get it. Yeah, what's Let's the make best? sure that viewers hear I, so I heard a humanist approach to grief. I have a lot going on. So I have an online learning company at Humanist Learning. Humanist All right. Learning. Uh, and I have a lot of online courses, and I have books, and I have DVDs, and I have streaming videos of everything. Okay. And some of the courses that might be of interest to your audience would be things like Socratic Jiu-Jitsu, How to Win Arguments Without Arguing. Um, reality-based decision-making for effective strategy development. I just had someone call me, uh, email me today about how they read the book and they're approaching their bosses completely differently now <laughs> because they've Good. spent some time thinking about what they want to get out of the relationship and to be more strategic about how they talk to their boss about some stuff that was going on. So I do a lot of um, corporate training I do harassment training for businesses that's science-based and humanistic-based. Like, I just did a McDonald's franchise in my state, and we did a combination of behavioral science as it relates to conflict management and de-escalating conflicts using behavioral science, but also um, some sessions on humanistic management and humanistic philosophy as it applies to the job of management. So, and I'm also a member of the International Humanistic Management Association, which is geared towards helping propagate the philosophy throughout the business world and management in general. Oh, thank you. So, this is 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 all meant to how we apply humanism, as, as a, and right. and we're contrasting this to people who just pray about their problems and hope that thoughts and prayers are going to somehow fix the world. So, all right. right. And this, to most areas of life. So if you go to a psychologist, you are most likely going to a humanistic psychologist oh, yeah. because it, it, it's what works. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, not, it's not that um, we hold special keys, it's that we use science and then we use the best tools of science and it turns out that being compassionate, being respectful, mm -hmm. being rational works. Yeah, my so, wife was for years. That's what we're doing. The same thing is, you know, if you go to a medical school, mm -hmm. you're probably involved in the gold humanist society. Every medical school in the country expects doctors to learn humanistic approaches yeah. to medicine, which are science-based uh -huh. and compassion-based. And you really don't want to have a doctor who's not humanistic in their approach. And this has nothing to do with their faith. It's how they think about what it is they're doing and whether they apply science to what they're doing or not. Are you um, saying, are you saying something like this? You like to have a doctor who, first of all, listens to you. Right. That's yeah, a humanistic exactly. you want approach. Them to know the science and you want them to listen. It's the same thing. There's humanistic nursing. There's humanistic sociology. Name the field. It's already 
already been transformed or in the process of being transformed by the humanistic approach. Humanistic, mm -hmm. not necessarily humanist, right? And mm -hmm. we're now, uh, most of the business schools around the country and around the world are starting to teach humanistic management mm -hmm. for a reason. Jennifer? Uh, and that's because it's really clear that exploitative capitalism does not work. But a humanistic approach to business actually accomplishes several things simultaneously. So, and it's not just like how you manage people, it's what is the point of business in the first place. Here's right? a question, so here's a question. Approaches yeah. question Jennifer. that are being made globally. Yeah. Let, um, let me back you up. You, you were talking about um, you know, medical training and, and you know, sociologist training and so on. And you mm -hmm. you use the word humanist. Do you think they typically do? They have course titles with the word humanism in it, or is it merely embedded and assumed, or is it likely that? It, yeah, they do. There's an association for humanistic psychology, for instance. But you notice it's humanistic, yeah. not humanist. And the reason for that is humanism is without supernaturalism. Humanistic is the is, is the word you use when you're applying this mm -hmm. philosophy towards an app, a, a particular application. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the practitioner might be a person of faith, but they're approaching the job humanistically, which means without supernaturalism and with compassion and reason and responsibility. All right. That, um, yeah, I, I was just thinking about you know my education as a physicist, and there was, there was certainly no class called humanistic um, um, uh, mechanics or anything like that. Um, right, but there wouldn't be, but there are, like if you're in a medical school, you're going to be encouraged to join the Gold Humanist Society. Oh, yeah. If you're in psychology, you're going to be explicitly learning about humanistic psychology because all of modern psychology is founded upon the humanistic movement within psychology. So, um, so that means when so, you're dealing with people in particular, that's where the humanistic ethics comes into play. Humanistic relationship. Well, it's, not just, it's not just the compassionate ethics for the individual, it's also the science based approach. You can't just be compassionate if your solutions don't work. Oh, well, yeah. Pa compassion and thinking go together. You can't be right. compassionate and brainless. Right. <laughs> they but go if together. If you go to your average doctor and you ask them about humanism, they know exactly what it is and why it's important. And it's the same thing mm -hmm. with psychologists. They know exactly what it is yeah. and why it's important to their field. And human resources. Humanism mm -hmm. is, the, like, is fundamental to the practice of human resources. That doesn't mean that the practitioners are atheists. It means that they understand the value system and the approach mm -hmm. and the pragmatic nature of this approach and how it positively impacts the job that they're trying to do. Okay. Well, thank you very much. All righty. Um, uh, uh, situational awareness. We are about six minutes or so out. Actually, probably about five minutes worth of discussion. Um, are there are there things that you want to make sure that we get talked about in these last five minutes? Well, let's talk about skepticism. Uh, well, well let, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Jennifer. <laughs> well, so skepticism is critical because if you're not skeptical, how do you know that you are right? Right? I mean, to me, when I Question talk about everything. skepticism, and I do courses on skepticism for business people and for <laughs> professional, I do personal and professional development. So individuals can take these courses, uh -huh. and then companies also hire me for groups, right? And then professionals also hire me to teach them individually. Yeah. Um, but when I teach skepticism, it's in service to problem solving. Yes. And yeah. it's a very optimistic activity in that we believe we have the ability to know what is true and what's not, and that knowing what's true and what's not is going to help us ultimately solve our problem more effectively. Mm -hmm. Let me make a point for viewers. So, Jennifer, you're describing a career path that humanism enables, um, and we might contrast that with the, the career path of a pastor or a minister, where they're going to get their ideas for how to advise people on how the world works out of, you know, a holy book. So that's, there's a very strong difference between, in a sense, the profession or niche you're carving out 
and the one that a pastor or minister would? Well, there's some overlap, right? So That's a good point. What a pastor is going to do for his congregation is help them learn how to cope with mm -hmm. the stresses of life. And one of the things I'm involved in is helping bring uh, non-woo self-help, like reality-based, compassion-based, responsibility-based self-help to people in the self-help field in the hopes that we can wean people off the solutions that don't work and help them learn coping skills that do work. And this impacts everything um, in all aspects of life because scientists really do know, like, let's take bullying, right? Most people have never been taught how to get to a bully to stop, and they think the only thing to do is to beat the bully up or to, like, hide from them, right? But there's actually a science. We have seven decades of research on how to get unwanted behavior to stop. Mm -hmm. There's a solution to this, and that solution works, and it works in a way that helps us maintain our dignity and our respect for ourselves while being very, very professional and not hurting the bully but getting them to stop. How cool is that? Right? But mm -hmm. we need to start sharing this knowledge and helping people actually solve their problems instead of giving them what I would call um, spiritual malpractice, which is, well, if you just think good thoughts, you know, your solutions will just magically come. No, that doesn't work. You know, there's things we can do to make life better for ourselves and for everyone else, and we should be sharing this knowledge and encouraging people to learn this knowledge because there actually are solutions that actually work despite the fact that most people selling them solutions are selling them snake oil, right? Let me ask, let me ask you a question. We should be helping people find the science so that they can actually solve their problem. And, and we got two minutes here, Joe and Jennifer. Hello, uh, if you're dealing with bullies, uh, you could use positive reinforcement to help a bully to find a more humanistic approach rather than... Right, and actually the science of it is neutral response um, coupled with positive response for the behavior you want. I can't get, we don't, I can't get into it in two minutes, but um, it's a little bit more deep than what you just described. But positive it's reinforcement. Yeah. <laughs> B.F. Skinner. And I have free courses. Let me, let me point this out. I have free online material that will teach you this skill that is science-based and will work. And Go there's ahead. no reason to not learn it because we have, you know, imagine if we had a society where no kid was bullied. Yeah, B.F. Skinner. That's not fantasy. Are you familiar That's with B.F. Skinner? Are you it's familiar not. with the work of B.F. Skinner? Yeah, exactly. And exactly. he, is, he emphasizes. So there's three reinforcements. There's negative reinforcement, positive reinforcement, and neutral response. And it's the neutral response that gets unwanted behaviors to stop. But there's more to it than just that because once you do the neutral response, the animal escalates and you have to be prepared for that escalation. Yeah. Which is why bullies retaliate. It's, it's predicted to occur. Well, that's why you need positive reinforcement for the kind of behavior you're trying to encourage. Ooh, I guess right. when, you, when you it happens. You positively reinforce the behavior you want, but you have to neutrally respond to the behavior you don't want. You issue a delta and then... Um, and then redirect. All right. But it takes a while, and there's a mm -hmm. little bit more to it than that because behavioral extinction is the hardest of the behavioral techniques to actually do. <laughs> um, we, we'll we need to give you about 15 seconds to sum up, and then we're going to have to start moving into our closing thing. So what's, our, right. the, well, what's the takeaway? There's, there's knowledge out there. It's free for the taking. Come to my website, Humanist Learning, and um, you know, mm -hmm. learn. Learn this stuff. Well, that's yes. great. It's, it's time to start wrapping things up. Viewers, get out your pen and paper. This has been Free Thought Forum, a program by the Atheist Society of Knoxville and the Rationalists of East Tennessee. You can give us feedback by email, freethoughtforum at yahoo.com, or on our Facebook page, Free Thought Forum, Knoxville. And you and your friends can see this show on Wednesday evening from 6.30 to 7.30 Eastern Time here in Knoxville. CTV Knox dot org. We would like to thank uh, Sam and Rev for technical support and the staff at CTV Knox and all of our callers and of course Jennifer Hancock for calling in and thank allowing you, us to interview her today. <laughs> well thank you. Nuns who identify with no religion are the fastest growing religious group in America. 
right here in East Tennessee, the atheists of Knoxville, the Atheist Society of Knoxville, the rationalists of East Tennessee are places where you can find fellowship and fun. So remember, you, you are, are not, not alone. alone. <laughs>